So, we start with the uh, uh, review of whatever we have discussed in the last class. So, we started with uh, application of probability in engineering, technology, uh, non mathematical sciences like biology, physics, etcetera, etcetera. I try to give you some example that probability is not just a, a branch of mathematics, but it has a lot of realistic applications that we have to deal with in real life. And not only science and technology, it goes beyond that. Uh, probability has application in uh, finance, it has application in management, it has application in almost any kind of subject and processes that you can think about. So, those were real life examples that we discussed. Uh, in the beginning of the last class. Then we discussed about uh, various kinds of uncertainty and we said that uncertainty is the primary thing why you are having a class like this. Okay. Uncertainty is kind of the uh, primary force that leads us to study the theory of probability and how to apply the theory of probability to make proper decisions under uncertainty. So, that phrase decision under uncertainty is very, very important. You will always be given conditions like uh, this is what is available with us. Given that information, given that data, what do you infer? So, again statistical inference, probabilistic inference, those things come into the picture. Then we discuss two different notions of probability. One is the subjectivist where it is more like a belief, belief of a person, what is the likelihood of some event and the other one is the frequentist, uh, which you are uh, going to follow mostly in this course, which goes by uh, the method of counting based on occurrence of events. You have some hard data and you use that data, you do some counting, do some mathematical uh, calculations and come out with uh, the likelihood numbers. Okay. I also said that for both kinds of uh, probabilities, the mathematics, the theorems and other things remain the same. So, whichever notion you apply, you can use the mathematics that you learn over here. Then we discussed about sample spaces, sample event, set theory and Venn diagram, which was a review for you anyway and axioms of probability. Those three axioms, I will uh, again look back at those. So, this was the first axiom that probability of an event E lies between number 0 to number 1 and that makes sense to you, right. We never say uh, the likelihood of an event is more than 100 percent or less than 0. We never say that it has a negative likelihood. No, that is something I cannot even imagine how it is going to be. So, this definitely makes sense. The second one again connected to the first one is that the probability of occurrence of anything in the whole sample space. Okay, S is the sample space and we know that the sample space has all the possible outcomes. So, any outcome lying in that sample space, what is the probability of that? That is 1, 100 percent. Okay. So, that was the second and the third one where we said that the union of various events E i from 1 to n, where these events are mutually exclusive. Uh, the E i E j being a null set, that intersection being a null set says that these two events do not have any common occurrences, no common outcomes for these two. So, if all E i and E j are like that, then the probability of the union of all these events are nothing but the summation of the probability of all these events. Okay. Those are the three axioms and they are of course, related to each other. And then we also uh, briefly went through these probability properties. And the first one says the uh, probability of occurrence of the complementary event E c is 1 minus the probability of occurrence of E. That also makes sense because 1 is nothing but the probability of occurrence of the sample space S. So, E is nothing but S minus E C. So, P E C you can write as 1 minus P E. As an example, I said this one, uh, if you, if the outcome of the, an event is uh, the sex of an unborn, uh, a newborn child, then uh, we can uh, write that this E, the event that uh, uh, 
it's a boy and the complementary event that it's a girl. Uh, these two constitute the whole set. So, they are also mutually exclusive. So, for these two we can easily see that the event that uh, uh, the newborn child is a girl child is nothing but 1 minus the probability or the likelihood that the newborn child is a boy child. Okay. And you also define something like odds of an event. Okay. This is defined in that uh, relative sense in the ratio of the probability of occurrence of an event E to the probability of occurrence of the complementary event. Okay. So, if uh, let us say that uh, the uh, uh, event E, the likelihood of the event E is uh, 0.45 and the likelihood of the event E C automatically for this one becomes uh, 0.55, then the odds of the event E is 0.45 over 0.55. Uh, that was another extension of the probability uh, axioms, uh, where we say that uh, the union of uh, two events, the probability of the union of two events is nothing but the summation of the probability of individual events minus the probability of the intersection event. Do you see that clearly? Of course, from set theory you know that, that E union f is E plus f minus E intersection f. But from a probabilistic sense, if you extend that to uh, the notions of outcomes of an event, does it make sense to you? Can I have a yes or no? Well, you know, you can just respond saying yes or no. Uh, so, okay, let us go through this example. Okay. So, uh, we take the outcome of the event, uh, which is the experiment is what is the age of a student in this class. And we cite two events over here. Event E says that uh, the outcome is uh, less than 16 year and 11 months event E is above 16 year and 11 months and the other event F is below 18 years. So, are these two mutually exclusive sets? No, they have something in common. So, of course, that uh, P E F, the intersection probability of that intersection is not 0 over here. So, E F is uh, all the outcomes which range in between the 16 year 11 months to 18 years. Now, you can see, I hope you can see very easily that uh, the E union F event, what will it be? What will be the value of P uh, E union F? Do you have any idea what will be that number P E union F for this class? Will it be 1? Because that constitute, that should constitute everything. Maybe P uh, probability of uh, the event A would be let us say uh, 0.4, probability of event F will be uh, 0.75, then probability of the intersection E F will be 0.5, you can do the math and you will get the probability of the union of E and F will be equal to 1. Okay. Uh, to simplify all these things, the best way is to draw a Venn diagram. So, let me uh, try doing that. Let us say uh, this is 16 year, 11 months and this is the 18 years. So, this thing is nothing but event E and this is event F. Now, can you see uh, that uh, uh, sentence that probability of E union F is probability of E plus probability of F minus probability of E F or E intersection F. So, let us get back. Uh, now, we uh, go to the definition of two types of sample spaces. Sample spaces are of two kinds, uh, uh, discrete and continuous. Uh, discrete sample space, I try to explain that through uh, examples. Uh, let the experiment be the outcome of rolling a die. What are the outcomes? 
if it's a six sided die then the outcomes are 1 2 3 4 5 6 you can't have any other number you will only have those six numbers as the outcome and these are discrete numbers which are the possible outcomes of the event so we call it a discrete sample space take the second one the number of students in first year classes over here so ic102 is one class take uh, any other class uh, uh, mathematics class or a physics class let's say for this class you have a population of 700 students for the other class you have a population of uh, 650 students for the other 683 students so anyway uh, these can have only whole numbers positive whole numbers as an outcome so again uh, that set will be a discrete sample space is the concept clear to you it can't have any number between 0 to infinity no if you if it could have any number between 0 to infinity then it could have included let's say square root of 2 but of course the uh, number of student in a class can be square root of 2 it can only be 1 2 3 and so on uh, the third example grade of a student in ic102 again these are discrete sample space it can start from a ab bb and so on but you cannot have see uh, uh, as opposed to expressing your uh, marks as percentage there you could have said that okay i have got uh, 80.123 percent or i have got uh, 65 percent that would be an example of a continuous sample space but when you are thinking in terms of grades then it is definitely a discrete sample space so now you also know about what the continuous sample spaces look like and here you have two examples so room temperature let's say of this room uh, this hall at any given time in degree centigrade so it, it could be any number right any positive or negative number from minus infinity to plus infinity theoretically so that is the continuous sample space or the average age of iitb faculty members let's say the average age is uh, at one given time it comes out to be 38 years at another given time it could be uh, 40 years one month two days and hours minutes seconds you can go on so again that's a continuous sample space because it could have any number from 0 to whatever be the lifespan of a human okay. so these are two different kinds of sample spaces we are going to use this concept later on when you discuss about uh, different kinds of probabilistic or uh, random distributions log normal log normal i hope you are familiar with the names so we'll see how do we deal with this different sample spaces then we go to the concept of equally likely outcomes there are certain sample spaces for example here is site one where we say that this is a sample space of equally likely outcomes so s is composed of these events e1 e2 to en and if we know that probability of e1 is same as the probability of e2 is same as probability of ei to probability of en then we say that s is a sample space of equally likely outcomes and we can easily compute the probability of each of these event ei as p equal to 1 over n where n is the total number of events considered okay now i want to i want you to see in detail of what i said over here this theorem does it say anything about the nature of those events e1 e2 to en other than being equally likely can you say anything else about those events e1 to en yes can you be a little louder mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive can you say that for definitely over here i want you to think about it a little bit okay so uh, example of equally likely outcomes uh, sample space with those is rolling of a fair or unbiased die the term unbiased will come very uh, often in a probabilistic uh, perspective we also sometimes say it's random by random we mean that there is no definite 
direction, there is no definite preference of one over the other. Okay. So, that is what an unbiased experiment would be. The second example is a picking of a ball out of a box with five red and five blue balls. Again, this is an experiment, you do not know what is there inside the box. You pick out a box, check its color and what is the event? If it is a red or a blue one is equally likely, because of the number of red balls and number of blue balls that are there in that box. The basic thing that I want to emphasize over here is that for sample spaces with equally likely outcomes, the primary thing that we need to do is to count the total number of outcomes. Okay? That is n. If we know n, we know that the probability of each outcome is nothing but 1 over n. These sample spaces, this may uh, whatever we discussed so far may sound a little bit theoretical one, but in real life also we many times see sample spaces with equally likely outcomes, very common. So, uh, can you give some example of sample spaces with equally likely outcomes? Give some real life examples, not uh, picking a, a colorful ball out of a box or rolling a die, tossing a coin, something else something else. I know those are uh, typical examples that we always discuss in a, a course of probability or mathematics. Go beyond that. See, I have tried to cite some examples in uh, last day's class, trying to give you some flavor of engineering applications, science application, biology applications of probabilistic theories, probabilistic concepts. So, can you cite something in uh, that sense? Nothing in the, that you can think is of uh, totally random in nature, any think in that direction. Okay. Use the Moodle forum for having these discussions. Yes, cricket matches, okay, very good. What? What is the event? Betting, okay. Okay, equally likely outcomes are is this uh, side win or the other side wins? But you will see betting odds are never 50-50. Uh, so, you can say usually it is equally likely outcome, right. Uh, that was a good case, but it is not necessarily a equally likely one. Okay, let us leave that there. Let us go to the concept of counting, because you say that for uh, sample spaces with equally likely outcome, this is what we do. We just count the total number and inverse of that is the probability of each individual event. The basic principle of counting says that if r number of experiments are to be performed and if the first experiment has n 1 possible outcomes and for these if the second experiment has n 2 possible outcomes and the third one similarly has n 3 and so on, then the total number of outcomes is nothing but the multiplication of all these n 1 to n r. Okay. Does it make sense to you? I think that should be clear. It is uh, it's like a matrix thing, uh, uh, an R dimensional matrix. Okay. So, the uh, first event has uh, n 1 outcomes. So, you think of uh, n 1 rows, let us say. The second event has uh, n 2 outcomes. So, now think of uh, for each one of that row, think of a column. So, that would be n 2 number of columns. So, you have a matrix of dimensions n 1 times n 2. Okay. Now, if you have a third uh, uh, outcome, then you will have a system with dimension n 1 times n 2 times n 3 and so on on a r dimensional space. You will have the product of n 1 to n r. So, for counting, we uh, try to use the concept of uh, the basic principle of counting and we use a lot of permutation and combination, which I am sure you are uh, very, very familiar with. So, I will skip going through uh, details of permutation and combination theories. You know a lot more than probably I know. And we will uh, uh, emphasize a little bit about uh, the consideration of replacement and ordering. Ordering means arranging or ranking of events. 
many a times you do this you know you you uh, specify specific uh, ranking of a number of events like when you uh, grading the first thing you do is to rank the numbers and many a times we have uh, to deal with problems of in how many different ways we can rank in how many different ways we can uh, arrange a system okay we'll go through some examples and a lot of examples are there in the textbook so i would request you to go through uh, those and the next tutorial problems also discuss with uh, similar concepts whenever we do sampling we go through uh, things like uh, if the sampling is with replacement and with ordering it could be with replacement without ordering and all combinations of these two kinds what do i mean by replacement let's take the example of uh, picking a, a ball out of a box so the previous example five red boxes five red balls and five blue balls and let's say you are supposed to pick uh, three now the probability of any event outcomes would be different if you pick the first ball and don't uh, return it back and then pick the second don't return it back and then pick the third that would have one probability as opposed to if you pick the first one return it back again pick another one return it back and pick another one return it back so this is with replacement and without replacement sampling similarly you can have ordering or not ordering well you have gone through permutation so you would know exactly what do i mean by ordering or arranging such examples are there a lot of these things you can find in any mathematics books uh, so we'll skip that part we won't go through the details we'll go through uh, simple examples so here we uh, discuss about a party where a person mr jones say uh, invites his friends for dinner and four are professors and we don't distinguish between professors and three are lawyers uh, the question is what is the likelihood that the first two guests are one professor and one lawyer and we don't bother about the order who comes first and who comes second we just say that of the first two one has to be a professor and the other one has to be a lawyer so this is how we do the calculation first we find out the what is the total number of outcomes we just count the total number of outcomes so for the first guest we have seven outcomes 4 plus 3 for the second guest because we are not replacing we have six outcomes okay so the for the first two guests the total number of outcomes as per the basic principle of counting is 7 times 6 which is 42 then you go to the specific cases which constitute of having one professor and one lawyer uh, the first case a which says the person coming first is a professor and the person coming second is a lawyer what is the possibility how many different ways it can happen like that number 4 times number 3 4 for the professor and 3 for the lawyer so in 12 different ways you can have that and if we change the order that means if the first person who arrives is a lawyer and the second person who arrives is a professor then the total possible outcome is also 3 times 4 which is 12 okay so the total possible outcome of the event that we have one professor and one lawyer is the previous one that is 12 plus this one that is 12 so this what we have 12 plus 12 divided by the total number of outcomes which is 42 this gives you the probability that of the first two guests one is a professor and one is a lawyer okay so this is very simple simple counting techniques uh, and this was uh, counting without replacement and without ordering for which uh, generic formula is n choose r can you guys see the formula over here at the bottom yes or no i take the second example where the same person uh, wants to arrange uh, some books in terms of uh, which category they uh, uh, fall in so let's say uh, the same person has uh, this five books on novels uh three short story collections and two books of others plays essays whatever 
and he wants to arrange them uh, category wise and we try to find out how many different kinds of arrangements possible. By categories arrangement, I mean that uh, uh, novels will be together, short story collections will be together and other books will be together adjacent to each other. So, we find the number of outcomes and we pick typical order. Let us say uh, at the very left, he puts the novels, in the middle he puts uh, uh, the short story collections and at the very right, he puts the other books. So, the order N S O will have how many different arrangements? 5 factorial, 3 factorial and 2 factorial, 5 is the number of novels, 3 is the number of short story collections, 2 is the number of other books. So, this is one way of arranging books. The other way of arranging books would be the second one, where he puts the short stories at the left, in the middle he puts the other books and the right novels. Then you will have the same number of arrangements, because it is again 3 factorial times 2 factorial times 5 factorial. And so, you find out in how many different ways you can put the set of novels, the set of short story collections and the set of other books. So, N S O, S O N, S N O, S O N and so on. You can have 3 factorial as the type of those orders N S O, S N O, O S N etcetera. There are 3 and you can permute them in 3 factorial different ways. So, the total number of arrangements possible would be 3 factorial times each. What is the likely outcome, uh, number of outcomes for each one? It was 5 factorial times 3 factorial times 2 factorial. So, that times the number of ways you can order them, which is factorial 3. So, this is the total number of arrangements possible, if you arrange them category wise. And if you want to find out the probability of having the novels at the very left, which is the orders N S O and N O S, only two orders possible, which is factorial 2. Then the total number of this possibility is 2 times that 5 factorial, 3 factorial, 2 factorial, divided by the total number of outcomes, which is 3 factorial times 5 factorial, 3 factorial, 2 factorial, gives you the probability of having the novels at the very left. Instead of going through all the detail, you can also say that, okay, there are uh, uh, three uh, types of books. I want to have one type at the very left, right. So, we can arrange them in 2 divided by factorial 3, instead of going to the second part, which is this 5 factorial, 3 factorial, 2 factorial, right. We are just thinking in terms of the order of book, NSO, NOS and so on, 2 out of 6. Now, you go to the third example and this you will find in any book that you pick. Uh, from a set of n items, a random sample of size k needs to be selected. Now, you can see when you say a random sample of size k, uh, we basically consider that it is a sample space of equally likely outcomes. Now, the question is, what is the probability that a specific item, let us say A, will be a part of those k that you have sampled? And the answer is this. Does it make sense to you? the samples that you are picking, those k, there has to be a specific one a in that k. Okay. That means, the possibility is, you are given the option of first picking one and then what are the options of having the others. Okay. How many others? Out of n minus 1, you are choosing k minus 1. That is the number of possibilities, number of outcomes of having 1 among the k. And what is the possible number of uh, ways that you can choose k out of n? That is n choose k. So, the total number is nothing but n minus 1 choose k minus 1 divided by 
n is k, which comes to be k out of n. Okay. Uh, then we discuss the concept of conditional probability. Are you familiar with this concept? You have gone through, so I will try to go through it quickly. Uh, it is written usually in this format and we call it P e given f, which is nothing but the probability of occurrence of an event e, given that the event a has occurred. Okay. So, there is the known information, there is the condition that event f has already occurred. So, you are trying to find out what is the probability of occurrence of event e in that situation. And f has occurred implies that the sample space has been reduced to f. Okay. I will I'll draw a Venn diagram to explain this thing simply. And in that f, it is only the intersection E f, which gives the possibility of having E also occurring given that f has occurred. Okay. So, I will shift this is what we are trying to understand through the Venn diagram. This is your sample space, this is E and that is f. Now, whenever you say given f, that means f has occurred. So, now your sample space reduces to f. Whatever outcomes are there has to come from that f. So, f is the new sample space and in that sample space, if E has to occur, which is the area representing that, this intersection. So, this will be nothing but E f divided by f. Does it make sense to you? And I hope most of you have gone through a similar concept. So, this is how we express the conditional probability. So, to find out the probability that E given f, that means f has occurred, what is the likelihood of E occurring is to find out that we need to know these two individual probabilities, probabilities of occurrence of E and of occurrence E f, the intersection. Now, we come to an example uh, dealing with this and we discuss the case of a traffic signal. Let us say this is a intersection of two roads and uh, the uh, one car reaches the intersection. It has three options, uh, one of going straight, which we denote by event S, one of turning left, event L and the other is to turn right. Let us say these are the three options and these are again what kind of options? Mutually exclusive and uh, collectively exhaustive, right. So, you say that these are three mutually exclusive events and they also constitute the sample set. That means, they are collectively exhaustive. And let us say we know the probabilities and it is given that the probability of going straight is double of the probability of going turning towards left and the probability of turning left is double of probability of turning right. These are known information. Based on that, we have to calculate some conditional probability. So, based on the first information, based on these two, we can find out individual probabilities. See, uh, P r turning right has the least probability, P l is double of that. So, if you uh, put uh, everything in terms of P r, so P l is 2 P r and P s is 4 P r. And these three probabilities summed up will be equal to 1, because that is the whole sample set. So, 4 p r plus 2 p r plus p r will be equal to 1. Based on that, we calculate the individual probabilities as p s is 4 p r by 7 p r, p l is 2 p r by 7 p r, p r is of course, p r by 7 p r. Is that okay? these calculations? Very simple. Now, the question is what is the possibility that a car turns left given that it is turning. Okay. So, you know that it is turning, it is not going straight, what is the possibility that it goes in the leftward direction. So, this is the probability we have to find out P l given l union r. L union r is of course, 
it either goes towards left or goes towards right. Can they happen simultaneously? No. So, you know that uh, L union R is nothing but L plus R. So, yeah. Uh, so, all this calculation, I do not know if you can read that, but we can simply say that this given L union R this is based on simple counting. Okay. Can you see how it can be P L over P L plus P R? Because uh, when you say that the car is turning, he reduced the sample space to that set L union R. And we know that L union R is nothing but P L plus P R. So, that is the total number of possible outcomes and we are finding the probability that it goes toward left. So, based on counting we can find out the solution. If you can look at this, if you can read this, you can see that you can also find out just using simple set theory formulas without going through the counting process and we get the same answer of 2 by 3. Uh, now, we come to the concept of statistical independence which is very much related to conditional probability. So, we say that if for two events E and F we have that P of probability of E given F is probability of E and probability of F given E is of probability of F. In other words, if the occurrence of E does not depend on the occurrence of F and vice versa, then we say that these two are statistically independent events. I okay. will go back. So, we say that the probability of occurrence of E which is P E is same as the probability of occurrence of E given F that F has occurred. Probability of E does not say anything like that. So, this means if F has occurred or not you have this probability and if F has occurred you have the same probability. right? So, the occurrence of E does not depend on the occurrence or non occurrence of F and if the other way is also true then we say that those two are statistically independent events. Now, the question is does it also mean that they are mutually exclusive events? No, right. So, we say that what we say that mutually exclusive events are a uh, much more stricter concept that statistically independent events. If those events are mutually exclusive, what would you have? It, it would say that if F has occurred, what is the likelihood of P of E occurring? 0. See, I will explain it again with uh, a Venn diagram. So, for two events which are mutually exclusive, then what is the probability of occurrence of E given that F has occurred? F has occurred means your sample space has reduced to this shaded area only F. Your outcome has to lie in that area. Now, if the outcome lies in that area F, then there is no likelihood that it would be in this area E. So, for mutually exclusive ones, you will have this equal to 0. So, when we say mutually exclusive, does it mean that they are statistically independent? And the next question is the other way around. When you say statistically independent, do you mean they are mutually exclusive? Is there any relation? Can mutually exclusive events be statistically independent? No? Okay, good. 
and then we extend again the concept of uh, conditional probability uh, through this theorem of total probability. And uh, to get there, we will first go through the multiplication rule, which is nothing but uh, the extension of the previous formula that we have seen, which was for E given f, yeah, extension of this. So, we just take this uh, denominator on the left hand side and this is what we have. Uh, the intersection uh, of two events, the likelihood of that is probability of E given f times probability of f or probability of f given E times the probability of E. That is the multiplication rule. From here, we go to the theorem of total probability, which says that if you have events E 1 to E n, which are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Does it mean that uh, uh, these are equally likely outcomes of a sample space? Yes, no? No, ok. So, we have this mutually exclusive that means disjointed and collectively exhaustive sets of events E 1 to E n. Then for an event A in the same sample space S, which is considered all these events E 1 to E n we can write the probability of occurrence of A as it is an extension of the multiplication rule. So, you can see what it is probability of A given E 1 times probability of E 1 plus probability of A given E 2 times probability of E 2 and so on to probability of A given E n times probability of E n. Okay. Again, I will uh, use the uh, diagrams. So, all is a very handy tool. Uh, this is total probability theorem. This is the sample space, which is constituted of let us say three events E 1, E 2 and E 3. Now, we uh, consider an event uh, A in the same sample space. So, now these three E 1, E 2 and E 3 definitely belong to the mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive kind of events for this sample space. So, what is the probability of occurrence of A? This is what we are trying to find out using the total probability theorem. You can see that uh, this is uh, nothing but P A E 1 plus P A E 2 plus P A E 3. So, this is A E 1. this one is A E 2 and this one is A E 3. Now, if those uh, are the intersections, then based on the multiplication rule, which we considered over here, we can write the total probability theorem that the total probability of an event in a sample space of several mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive events are the probability of that event given any of those event times probability of any of those E i's and the summation of that. In real life also you see many application of these kinds of events. I will uh, go through one simple example. Yeah. Uh, it says, uh, we are trying to find out uh, the likelihood of a dam overflowing. Okay. And the, uh, this likelihood we denote by O depends on the flood in the upstream river or the rainfall that occurs in the upstream river. And the river situations can be described in three different ways and only these three disjointed events, which is number 1 flooding denoted by f and we know the probability of flooding okay, that is 0 0.3 E 
if it remains normal, the probability of remaining normal level is 0.5 and if it remains below normal or low flood level, we say it is 0.2. See, it is uh, basically uh, the event of flooding might be a continuous sample set, but we are breaking it up into three different regions, three different events of collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive set. If we know this and if we also know the conditional probabilities that if there is flooding in the upstream river, this is the likelihood of overflow of the dam which is 90 percent. If it is at the normal level at the upstream river, then it is 50 percent of having flood at the dam and if the water level is low at the upstream river, then the likelihood of overflow is 0.1. If we know this information, then we can find out the total probability that it will be a overflow at the dam. And using the total probability theorem, we find it out. So, it will be nothing but uh, the probability of O given flooding times probability of flooding, which is 0.9 times 0.3, probability of overflowing given normal flood level upstream times probability of normal flood level 0.5 times 0.5 and similarly for the low flood level. So, this total information tells you the total probability that you will see an overflow at the dam given various conditions at the upstream river. Okay. So, this is just a summation rule and of course, you can understand that uh, instead of considering this uh, discrete uh, three events E 1, E 2, E 3 or uh, uh, F n and L if uh, we consider the events to be continuous in a continuous sample space, instead of summation we will do an integration of the conditional probability times the individual probability of those events. Okay. I think that concludes today's talk. Yeah. So, this is what we covered. We started with the review of probability properties, sample space of equal likely outcomes we discussed and the counting principle and discussed examples with counting, conditional probability, examples of conditional probability. We extended that to uh, the multiplication rule, theorem of total probability and finally, the example on total probability theorem. Okay. Thanks.